the people myself, then there would have been some kind of something. But <laughs> hey, the spirit, wine. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How's it going? Fine. Can you hear me? Yes. I do have a loud voice. Well, I just want to clear up that I didn't change my clothes to make a fashion statement. I just needed to. And I also want to test if you remember me with other clothes. <laughs> Linda, uh, Linda Jean, I had to miss your workshop, but I just had to go and refuel. <laughs> so I'm sure it was great, and a few people already told me it was a wonderful afternoon. That is great. So beloved, this morning we reflected together on a spirit-led life that gives us new orientation. Actually, Norm shared something with me that on his drive on Highway 30 and his GPS is not up to date. So the GPS didn't show any Highway 30 on it. So it kept on telling him, turn around, turn around. So that shows you, see, the spirit takes you places that the GPS doesn't even know. <laughs> we heard the story of Lazarus. We heard about the bones in the valley from Ezekiel. And we heard from Paul to Romans and how to live a life of Christ-centered life. We concluded that to live a spirit-led life, we need to be there, to be present. And that presence will inspire us, and that inspiration will move us. I have to tell you, 99% of inspiration is perspiration as well. So get ready to work. <laughs> Someone wrote on my Facebook page yesterday when I said, here we come, Cornwall, going for a conference. And she wrote, a rolling rock collects no moss. <laughs> so if we want our lives, especially our life of faith, to be clean and to be sparkling and no mosses around, then we need to keep on going on our faith journey and move with the spirit and dance with the spirit. This afternoon, I invite you to look with me at the spirit-led life that sees new possibilities. Our focus will be Hannah, just in case you didn't catch that, the mother of the prophet Samuel. I'm not sure about you, but there is something about the Old Testament stories that make me love the Bible more and more. I know we Protestants, we focus on the, I mean United Church Protestants, you know what I mean. We focus on the New Testament a lot and try to ignore the Old Testament. But not all, we, some of us love the Old Testament. Maybe because in the Old Testament, the stories show us that everything that happened so many centuries ago still applied to us every single day in the 21st century. On a side note, I do want to say that I believe we, you and I, all of us, we are still writing the Bible. The Bible, the book that you have in your hands or on your internet or on your app, it hasn't finished yet. It's not ended, it's not concluded. You and I are still writing it. See, the Bible, the book itself, might have the book of Revelation as the last book of the collection. But you and I and our experiences of God and God's presence in our lives and our mindfulness of God in our lives, we are still writing the Bible. For me, the Bible is a book where the stories reveal to me the human experience of God and the relationships people have had with God and with each other. And we are still doing the same thing. We are still trying to figure out, we are still to figure out 
this relationship with God and leading a godly life that we are called to lead. Asking questions is okay. When I was a little girl, I was told never to talk unless I was asked a question. I was told never to ask a question about God because this was it. <laughs> so here I am, living our questions of faith is okay. Because more, more questions we ask, and we might not have the answers per se, but we might come up with other questions that help us understand the previous questions. So there is never, ever, at some questions, the concrete answer, but there is always the foundation of love is called to be the concrete foundation of the questions and the answers that we have about God and our faith journey. The life of faith might sometimes seem like a life of doubt. Doubting Thomas wasn't a bad person at all by asking questions, and it is okay to ask. Today, this afternoon, the reading from the first book of Samuel is about the birth of Samuel, or the beginning of his birth, the first prophet of ancient Israel, who is going to find the first king of Israel and anoint him, and that is King David, the son of Jesse, and you guys know this through Advent season all the time, the son of Jesse, who is the root of the family of who? Jesus himself. So this afternoon, it may seem that the Old Testament and the New Testament readings have nothing in common. But I do see something in both of them. As both readings were different styles, one was a story, a narrative, and the other one is a letter, the topic that jumps out at me through those two is how to live with hope when all hope is invisible. We all know how life can seem very limited sometimes. We are limited to our aging, it's part of life. We are limited to pain. Some of us wake up in the middle of the night and we have pain in our legs, in our arms, in our heads, whatever. We are limited to suffering. We are limited to our finances. We are limited sometimes to our abilities of what our bodies have come to. But one thing for sure we are not limited to is our attitude. I repeat, we are not limited to our attitude and our outlook on life. How is our attitude is up to us. In the story of Samuel's mother, Hannah, we know not much about her, except she was the second wife of a man, and I'm forgetting his name. And we hear about, very important thing in those days, the reproductive status of this woman and the, two wi and the other wife. So Penina, the other wife, had children and Hannah did not. Therefore, Penina is considered blessed and Hannah is considered disgraced. And her life is led on this cloud of shame in the eyes of society. Maybe if you allow me, I'll share a little anecdote from my life. It's not in my notes, it just came to mind. When I met Gary back in 99, face to face, January 3, a um, few people heard that I started seeing this guy and some ladies started a gossip. You know, it runs everywhere, and Armenians, Canadians, everywhere. 
So this Armenian lady said that, oh yeah, I know that guy. He went out with my daughter and he is divorced with children and the only reason Takuhi is going out with him because she can't have babies. So now she has already babies with that man. Oh my goodness. I'm still waiting for those kids to show up. <laughs> So, you know, 1999, this isn't ancient Israel, but there are some people, right? So those around her, of Hannah, maybe probably wondered why she didn't, she wasn't able to have children. See, they didn't think about medical stuff. I mean, in 1998, they found cancer-prone cells in my uterus and it had to be removed, as simple as that. But in Hannah's day, poor Hannah, who knows what was going on with her body, right? Yeah. So not being able to bear children meant a punishment from God in those days. So that is how people perceived if you had children, you had blessings from God. And if you didn't, you were doomed. So more than this, ancient Israel's I should say ancient Israelites imagined that life after death was living through your children. So in a way, they weren't far off. How many times have we done something that we have learned from our parents, right? Mm -hmm. And whenever we do it, we remember it, we remember them and we help them live through us. Let's push this envelope one more step. Having a son in ancient Israel for a woman meant the world. Because when her husband passed away, everything her husband had, all the wealth, went to the son. I should say the sons. So it could be the second or third child, whatever, but they went to the sons. So, therefore, the wife was only taken care of by her sons after her husband died. Hannah, not only she didn't have sons, she did not have any children, period. At least if she had a daughter and her son-in-law would have taken care of her. You see? So her barrenness meant an uncertain future. A future without hope, a future of devastation if her husband ever died before her. So year after year, no one understood the depth of Hannah's pain. No one understood why she barely ate with the family gatherings. And to add insult to her injury, Hannah's husband did not get it either. He would ask her, oh Hannah, why are you not, why are you crying? Why are you not joining us for the party? Why are you so sad? Well, sometimes people will never understand what you're feeling. The story says, though, that he loved her more than the other wife. But his words did not show the level of sensitivity and understanding that Hannah needed. Hannah finally reaches the breaking point and decides to go to the temple and plead with the one who hears her prayers. He goes, pleads with God for a son. Are you getting spirit bumps like I am? As Jennifer Lopez will say, what does she say? She says, oh, I got gooses all over to my toes. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah is specific about her 
request. She does not settle for a child. She does not settle for any child. She requests a son. Her pain is so deep that she prays so fervently, quietly, but fervently, and comes across to the priest as a drunk woman, full of spirits. <laughs> I want a picture with you afterwards. <laughs> and the priest thinks that she is drunk, but she tells her her story and says, after the priest says, go home and sober up, woman. But she explains her situation, and the priest sends her away with a blessing. The story then follows what we expect to happen, right, from this God that we ourselves call Lord. Hannah goes home. Just like ordering Domino's pizza 30 minutes or less, she conceives a child, <laughs> gives birth to a son. I know it's not in my notes. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I'm telling you, what's in this coffee? <laughs> So Hannah goes home, conceives a child, conceives and gives birth to a son, not a girl, a son, just like she prayed for. The perfect end to a fairy tale, isn't it? But it is not. The story hasn't finished yet because God has just got started with Hannah. Hannah promised to God that she will dedicate the son to the service of the Lord. The son is bringing not only new possibilities to Hannah, the son is bringing new possibilities to ancient Israel. And because God keeps God's promises, and Hannah keeps her promises to God, all things are beautiful once again. There is hope, not just for Hannah, for the entire nation. Beloved, this is a story not to show us, pray and you're gonna get everything you ask for because God is waiting for your to-do list. No. This story is about relationship. Having relationship with the Holy One that shows us and reveals to us hope and possibilities beyond our imagination. This story shows to us that a spirit-led life sees possibilities beyond her needs beyond her wants and it goes to the possibility of transforming the world. One of my favorite phrases of this reading is that after she prayed she ate and her countenance was sad no longer. When was the last time you prayed and right afterwards you felt joyous again. See, I didn't say happy, because happy could be happy anytime. We can pretend to be happy, but joy comes from a deeper place. So when was the last time you prayed and right after the word Amen, you were no longer worried or anxious? I'm not sure about you, but I have experienced say, seeing individuals that after they finished praying, their face literally turned bright. Something, something happens in our physical, I don't know, 
something happens. It's beyond my understanding. And in the words of the author of the epistle of Hebrews, Hannah knows that God is able to alter her situation. And she approaches God with hope. She enters God's presence with assurance, confessing her faith in the God that she knows that will never ever waver God's promises. She was certain that the God of Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel is also her God. That same God is faithful. God's promises are for all God's beloved. Do you know who they are? God's beloved? Us. We are all beloved. You and I. The entire human race, the entire creation, the entire creatures, they are all beloved of God. You see, we are called beloved and we are invited to treat everyone as beloved. You may not like few people and what they do, but we are called to love those people even though we don't like what they do. See, love and like are two different things. We are called to love relentlessly. One of my teachers, a spirituality course I did at Concordia, uh, she said that her niece was staying with her. So I can tell this story because I don't know where my teacher is anymore. <laughs> And it was, what, 12 years ago? So she said her niece was in town and staying with her, and this young girl, she wanted to go out, and she did. She went out every night and had a good couple of drinks and came back home very drunk. So my teacher said, I had to make her sit down when she sobered up. And I said, I love you, but I do not like who you become after you have so much drinks. There's a big difference, right? So in the same way that we are loved, we are called to love. In the same way when we enjoy the bounty of this earth, we are called to share that bounty with others. And Canada has done that to me and is doing to others still. When you have land, 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 I mean, we can fit at least 20,000 Lebanons in Canada. That's how big your lands are. But just like the priest sends Hannah home with a blessing, we are called to bless one another. Because we are all priests. Did you know that, Grace? You're a priest. Claim it. <laughs> Did you know that, Norma? You're a priest. We all are. We are all priests as per Peter, 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. This is the community of Christ, beloved. This is you and I. We are called to take care of one another. At that infamous 1978 15-day war that I shared with you last night, one day during that 15 days, my warrior mother said, she's going to the bakery to see how much bread she can bring home. Of course, in the darkness of the day, because remember, we didn't see the sun for 10 days. There was so much smoke all around us. My father and everyone else, I remember clearly they told her, Navart, do not go. By the way, Navart is her name, and that means a small rose, the baby rose that's not open yet. So my father and everyone else said to her, don't go, are you crazy? Well, and, and you know, you're certain what she said. 
She said, the one inside of me is telling me to go. So she went. <laughs> well, I think you know what happens next. She came back home with the freshest hot pita breads that I have never eaten before. The, the steam was still coming out of it. See, the baker, George, I remember his name, had decided that he will keep on making bread as long as he has flour and will stop making it when he runs out. And this bakery was at a semi-basement kind of a place. So the baker felt safe enough to just bake. And whoever came, he would offer the bread. So she came back home, not just with the one bag full of hot pita bread, but six bags. Wow. Fresh out, out of the wooden oven. She left the four bags with us in the apartment. And she said, now I got to continue to go to the school, to the church, to see if the minister is hungry. Okay. And that was two blocks away from us, the other direction. So she had to go to the bakery that way, come back home, and from here, go that way. So she went for an hour or so. And thank God she returned home safely without bread, of course, because she took the both bags to short story. When I was in El Salvador, thanks to Bay of Quinty uh, conference, I had the chance to go twice, once in 2014 and once this year at March break. We have um, global partners there, uh, Baptist, Emmanuel Baptist Church, who is also um, twinned with Yes, thank you. Edith Rankin in Kingston and also with Emmanuel Church in Ottawa. I met this young man. He, he, they were calling him Kevin. And Kevin, he, they told me the story with Kevin's permission being present with me because he only spoke Spanish. Um, they said Kevin has been coming to this church for only six months now and he left a gang and joined the church. See, this church, Emmanuel Baptist Church in El Salvador, it goes places where no one else wants to go, not even government. Like, they don't want to go places, right? So they go and build places for youth to have a place to belong and to learn things. There is the very first little youth center they built about a couple of blocks away from their church ages ago, and it's called Calpapil. And that is where you go and you pay $10 a month and you get piano lessons, English lessons, computer lessons, whatever, whatever. And they teach you the violin lessons. So it's a place where kids can leave gangs and belong to something better. Well, this time when I went back, I didn't see Kevin. Oh, I have to say that Sunday back in 2014, Kevin, only being introduced to church six months, he led the offering prayer without any notes. He prayed from his heart. This year when I went again, one of the guys that remembered me also, and uh, his name is Victor, who was here last week, he actually said, oh, Takuhi, do you remember Kevin? And I said, yes, where is he? You know, I was looking for him. He said, after three years, he mastered playing the violin so well he got a job in San Francisco, California. <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> right? Who would have thought that a little youth center in San Salvador will offer this young man a new life, a new possibility? But I have to tell you, this church, Emmanuel Baptist Church, their pastor Miguel, they have learned how to dance with the spirit more than I can imagine how to learn it. But I think those are good lessons for us to learn from our global partners. You know, when we say, oh, we're going on a mission trip, those mission trips are no longer what we used to go as missionaries to tell them what's the right way. I go to these mission trips because I want to learn how to live my life as Christ did. Because that's what we can learn. Beloved, no one has a free pass in this life 
from difficulties of life. We all know that. Not even ministers. <laughs> but when we are living a mindful life with the Spirit, we will see endless possibilities that are beyond our imagination. When we are faithful to Jesus, who has called us in the communities we are found, we will make it through everything all right. If you have one thing to remember from this weekend, I urge you to remember that every moment you breathe in grace, breathe out gratitude and also pay attention to the present being your present time and being a gift for you and when you receive that gift it is to share it with everyone else be present be confident like Hannah be inspired and inspire others like the priest and get moving into a new and transformed life like Lazarus and the entire community is called to these tasks and we are that community no matter where we are from Montreal, Quebec, Seaway Valley, Bay of Quinty, wherever we are found we are the community of Jesus so may all the glory be to the Holy One who has created us, who has called us, and who has equipped us for all that there is for us to do. Amen.